Cook's firstborn uh, descending figure, the house on Marshland, have earned you great acclaim. People talk about you as a new species of poet. Everything she touches turns to music and legend and beautiful criticism such as that. What is your response when you read the press that your work has generated? Well, it's not all, it's not all of that kind. I mean, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time talking about the things that people have said that are not like that. Um, is it a good day for a poet to be critically acclaimed, or is it a good day for a poet when the po poem just spills out across the page? Uh, uh, well, uh, you, I can tell you something about the, the response that I had from not friends but acquaintances when the Vendler piece that you quoted, um, the first one, uh, appeared in the Times. People would call me up and say, I didn't know you knew Helen Vendler. I don't know Helen Vendler. But the point is that it was assumed that that was how things like that were arranged. Um, it, it's naturally delicious to have someone praise you in um, a periodical that has wide circulation. Uh, it's the best possible way to get revenge on your childhood enemies. You hope that they'll read it and think, <laughs> God, they're sorry they were mean to you. Um, that's its effect. That's its force. That's what it, what's appealing. Um, what stays with you as um, something either very good or very bad, depending on the nature of the description, is the criticism that seems to you accurate, um, that seems to have grasped your central preoccupations, that, ha that has described the poetry in ways that sound, make, make the description correspond to your own secret description. And if praise attaches to a description like that, then uh, that's exhilarating. Um, if negative criticism attaches to something like that, um, that's depressing because that's the criticism you recognize as intelligent, whether you're right or wrong. That's how, that's how you would know it. Um, when you're praised for qualities you, you don't find in the work or qualities you think that the um, reader is essentially projecting, um, when you feel that the poems are being misread, then you can't take quite the same pleasure in the uh, laurels, and you can't be quite as disturbed by the negative things that are said. But it's the issue of reputation is, an, is something that you can't control, and that's what all of that stuff is about. And you have your poems to write, and you hope that you'll write them. Um, you have your poems to write. What about the creative process? Yeah, what about it? <laughs> How much does, are you writing for an audience? Are you writing for yourself? Or is it a combination of all of that? Are you writing on the basis of, of some criticism maybe you've you've had uh, in addition to you you just wanting to write uh, how much do all these things fit into the creative process for you well I think that you write for an ideal reader um, in Gainesville about a week ago um, someone quoted Nabokov who was asked the same question and who responded by saying that he wrote for thousands of little Nabokovs um, you write for the great dead as though they were going to descend from heaven and say, good work, Louise, if you got it right. Um, and that's not going to happen. It's all, it, you, don't, I, you don't write for, uh, an audience that you could, say, go out and find or, or gather together. Um, the response, um, the temporal response that most pleases me is when it's good is the response of poets I admire. Such as? Oh, I think I mustn't get into that. <laughs> I mean, I, I no, I, I, I think that that, you, you end up naming um, people you're close to and then I, I would regret bitterly having forgotten someone. Yes, so. yes. You teach as well as write. Yes. Um, 
I'd like to hear more about that. Can you teach a poet to be a poet? Uh, uh, the, pr the program that you're working in now uh, in North Carolina, could you talk a little bit about that and how that program succeeds where some others might not have before? Sure. Um, well, no, you can't teach someone to be a poet, but there's a great deal more talent than there is um, poetry. And what you can do for someone who has a natural gift is significant. You can transmit knowledge of craft. You can transmit um, an attitude of dedication. Um, you can teach people uh, habits of scrutiny, which will serve them later. You can teach them to be better readers. Um, all of these things will help them in their, in their writing. You can't take someone who has no interest in poetry, no gift for it, and turn that person into a poet. Um, nor can you take the competent poet and, by definition, raise that poet to some higher power, make that person... Well, I ha in fact, the, the terms competent and poet really are mutually exclusive, and I, I, I detest the the ease with which we use the noun poet. It seems to me that I would much rather go back to a time when it was a word, not, not this, there was no such time, but it, I would prefer it to be um, a word that w was used on a person's death, that it was sort of conferred like a title. Um, because the, the fact of making poetry doesn't make one a poet, and a, a poet is a rare thing. It's what you hope to have been. Um, Do you not feel that you're a poet? Oh, of course, I secretly think I might be one of those. I might be one. But I want to think of it as a very great thing to aspire to. Um, and I think I have a crack at it. That's what I think. Um, I'm talking in very small numbers. I don't think you're going to get ge a generation filled with them. I'm talking a small, like that, in a generation. Maybe. Do we want a generation filled no, with poets? No, well, not necessarily, but you, you want good readers. In any case, the, the program I teach in now is a graduate program that's uh, low residency, which means that um, the students don't move to Swannanoa, North Carolina, take up residence there, and go to workshops. Um, they and we, the faculty, convene for two 12-day residencies each year, separated by six-month interval. And most of the work is done through the mail. And I, it's very difficult to say that because you always feel a sense of suppressed snicker, such as you would have yourself had if someone said to you, I do my work through the mail. We all know about correspondence schools. Um, this is simply the best teaching that I have ever done. The students are the best students I have ever had. Um, the college is called? Warren Wilson College. And the program is its first master's program. The, the program didn't originate at Warren Wilson, but at a nameless northern institution. Um, we, the faculty, as, as a body, resigned from that school, and so did our director. And it's, I think, a tribute to the program's um, extraordinary quality that the enrolled student body, except for four students, waited a year until we had found another school out of which we could um, run this program. And so the students write to their faculty supervisors uh, at intervals of three weeks, and each supervisor answers these student letters um, singly. So what this means is that the student is getting the full attention of the poet or fiction writer with whom he or she is studying. And there's no jockeying for place. There's no so-and-so is getting more attention than I am. Um, there's no whose poem is the first poem on the worksheet. What and are you seeing in these students and their work? What, what are you seeing? Oh, they're so different one from another. I mean, I, it's impossible to generalize. And I think that 
Well, I mean, we, we have a strict admissions policy. Mm -hmm. We try only to accept people who seem to show either promise or accomplishment. Um, we, it's not a conservative admissions policy, though. If, if a manuscript is read and one of the people who, who's on the admissions board feels that there's something there, not a big something, but something. If someone, will, if someone in that room feels that strongly, um, and if there's anything in the application essay to support uh, admission, we'll, we will admit. Um, what we shy away from is the kind of established competence that really suggests that the person is, has gone as far as he or she can go. Um, if you get, there are some places where um, response will be favorable to an application manuscript that contains Xeroxes of magazine publications. See, I've already published. That's not what we're interested in at all. And um, there is, in fact, no magazine nor book publisher that really functions in this culture as a sanctioning body. And the approbation of those magazines doesn't mean that the poet is a bad poet, but it doesn't mean that the poet's good either. And it, it speaks ill of this, the applicant that he or she has assumed that this publication means excellence. And it's going to make that person harder to teach because what's going to happen is you, a faculty person's going to say, this poem's really, this poem needs a great deal of work. And the person's going to say, this poem has been published. And it, there's a kind of cushioning against the, the receptivity that one would want in students. And, uh, but yourself as a poet, that first poem published in The New Yorker, though not a sanctioning publication that must have been uh, it was a real high it was terrific yeah but it's it's better when it doesn't it's better when students aren't thinking of that time as um time spent how can i put it you don't want them thinking about getting their first books together while they're also trying to learn uh, their craft. Because they'll be much more attuned to the marketplace than they should be prematurely. And um, it's a time when mistakes should be made, when things should be experimented with, when um, strategy should be tried, and not uh, a time when polish should be acquired necessarily. I mean, there's a great deal of polish. There's too much polish and very, and, and far less um, of the essential stuff of poetry around. I mean, there are great many poems. I mean, there are magazines made to accommodate poems that are competently made uh, and that really need not have been written. And if, I mean, we all write, I suppose, poems like this that just, they muddy the water. I, I'd rather my students not write poems like that. It sounds like, uh, it sounds so pure. And you're talking about Oh, it's about revoltingly the, pure. Yes. And you're talking about these students, and I'm thinking about Louise Glick and wondering how she was a, a student of the, of the craft, of the art. I was a very diligent and lucky student, and I think that one of the reasons that that I feel deeply about teaching, I, I like to teach, um, is that through teaching you thank your teacher. I can't thank my teacher by doing him the favor, he, the favors he did me. The favors had to do with his scrutiny, the habits of attention that he taught me. He knows them. I can't give them back to him but I can pass them on. And uh, I realize that the impulse to pass them on is a form of gratitude. It's the expression of gratitude. Um, I was very lucky. I studied first with uh, Lanny Adams at the School of General Studies at Columbia. She was, uh, well, I have mixed feelings. Of, well, no, I don't have mixed feelings about her poems. I, I don't love her poems. 
but she was a marvelous teacher, and she was terrifically, oh, she was a brilliant woman. Um, she used to smoke cigarettes. She, was, she would light several at once, and she had a gray hair and a Buster Brown, and you'd watch the cigarette, not just, you'd watch the way the ash accumulated. You've seen people smoke like that. And you, you know that you sh should be concentrating on the words, but you just can't take your eyes off the ash, waiting for it to drop. And then she would burn, she was constantly burning her fingers because she'd f forget in her passion for her subject the fact that she had several cigarettes going. And uh, she was covered with these little scars. That was Lanny. And then I, then I studied for, oh, four years, I think, with Stanley Kunitz, um, who was a remarkable teacher. Uh, and um, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to both of them. Um, it's impossible for me to know what I would have been without them. I mean, there's no way you can do a control study and decide to grow up twice, once with, once without. Um, what is this evolution all the critics talk about, the evolution that transpired between your first book and Descending Figure? Um, I know you must know what they're talking about in, in the sense that you, you're constantly growing as a poet and as a person. Well, you hope. <laughs> you don't know. You just hope. What do you feel they're, they're referring to? Uh, are well, they t talking about your subject or the texture or the cadence of the... The two books are very different, and some of what that, those comments are about is registering difference. They're also, they're also the critics making a value judgment. They're saying the second book is really good, and the first book maybe was not so good. I think the first book... I spent long years detesting the first book, though obviously I, I thought well of it when I put it together. I'd not have signed any of those poems with my name if I hadn't at the time thought that they were good. Excuse it's me, but I don't remember anyone saying they weren't good, but they... People said that. <laughs> they, yeah. they did. Well, I didn't read any of those reviews. Oh, sure, but, uh, sure. But um, just that you had evolved to a different place altogether, and you sounded your, like yourself instead of perhaps like some other poets. Well... The first book is precocious. I mean, it, it was published when I was very young, and um, the only way I can now come around to thinking anything good of it is to think, well, those poems are pretty good for someone that age. Um, it's feverish and uh, unprofound, and uh, it's technically proficient, but... Um, not not spiritually sterile, but it, it's it's not rich. I think I th I would say that that would be my description. I didn't think that then, of course. And one of the things that you realize when your opinion about a body of work changes, your own work, say, is that your opinion about the poems that you're writing at any given time is likely to change. And um, one of the things that forces you forward is your repudiation of existing bodies of work. Um, if you wrote a, a book or a series of poems in which you took complete and permanent satisfaction, it would be very difficult to write much else. There would be very little impulse to. But part of what constantly presses you on is your feeling that, that the existing poems are inadequate, insufficient. You don't like them anymore. You, you push them away from you. And uh, anyway, you also have to manage to um, redirect yourself. And, and a lot of the ways that you do that are, are practical and technical. Firstborn is a book in which the poems became increasingly written in very short sentences until they weren't in sentences at all but in fragments. And that became a kind of tropism. It was the only way I knew how to write poems. So that when I finished that book... Well, I had a very long period of not writing, which was very terrible to live through. And one of the things that writers need is tremendous patience, because you have to survive these periods of non-production or poor production. Um, and I f forced myself to write poems that were long, Latinate, suspended sentences, um, because I had gotten in this habit of refusing 
sentences. And so all the poems had a terrible sameness. I mean, it didn't matter that I was writing here about a tree and there about a river and there about a mother. And it didn't matter. The poems sounded the same. The message of the poem, the first message of the poem is tone, and the tone was undeviating. So to break that, you have to break the uh, technical habits. So I made myself write very long sentences. It took me a long time to do it, though. And then I found out that there was another way that I could sound. That was exhilarating. So I wrote a lot of more poems. Very slow. I wrote very slowly. Um, in dreamy, shimmering sort of sentences. That was another book. Then I did. Then I could not repeat the mannerisms of those poems, or what came to be mannerisms. I mean, initially they're discoveries, but if they're repeated too many times, then they become mannerisms, and you become their prisoner. And part of the one of the things that's that's difficult is if you're going to be too interested in the criticism your work receives. Certain critics are going to love you at certain phases. They're going to prefer certain modes. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to regret your turning from those modes. They're going to want more poems like that. And um, you have no choice but to go on. You really have no choice. But if you begin to participate in their nostalgia, then you can't invest your new work with any kind of hope. So I think it's unwise to be too responsive to that criticism, to let it shape you. Occasionally someone will say something sharp enough so that you actually learn something about your work, which has happened to me recently. But that's When did that happen? What, did, what was said? Oh, it was a very, very long essay, and it was... Um, it, it was praising, and I felt just terrific. I, <laughs> I got the magazine in which it appeared, uh, and um, immediately read this 20-page essay. In, in, we were, I was with my husband in a car in New York. We're, we're driving around the city, and I'm <laughs> pouring over this, reading out the, 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 the precious phrases. It feels great. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. You like that. It's a sensation that no one, no one would dislike, I think. Um, and uh, I hesitate to say what it was that I learned from the essay because it's still secret knowledge and I haven't yet mm -hmm. written any of the poems that prove what, I, what I've learned. It's not what I've learned. It's that I had a sense suddenly of what that next stage should be, the way from firstborn to the house on marshland I realized no more short sentences. I mean, this is, not a, this is not so much a technical issue, though in, in those terms, I, I did realize, oh, about two years ago, that I didn't write poems that had questions, and I didn't write poems that had contractions. And so I thought, all right, questions and contractions. You have to tell us where you're going from here. I don't know. If I knew, it would be a horrible thing. And you never feel as though you, you never feel a sort of sure sense of direction. You're always sort of drifting, and, and you, I mean, people will say, are you writing well? I don't know. I mean, slowly the poems accumulate, and then at some point or other you begin to sense that there's material enough for a book. Not just material enough, but you begin to sense an organizing principle. You begin to sense how a book could be shaped, and, uh, and you begin to do that work. And, and that's immensely instructive. It's, it's at that point that you realize really what the um, binding elements are, which is to say the repetitions. And it's tremendously distressing sometimes. Um, and it's useful at the end of that project of putting a book together to, you'll, you'll always discover certain words that, that recur. I count the number of times they do. Um, and uh, that's just for the days when I'm feeling too good about myself. I just read my little list of recurring adjectives and it, that'll send me into a plummet. You can't touch them again, then, for a while. Um, it can be useful in a book. It can make a book that has tremendous integrity, but you, you can't then. I mean, after, 
after the house on Marshland, I could not talk about ponds anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, no ponds, no moons. What are you talking about up, up here now? I for? can't tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's... But you're keeping a journal. No. No? No, I don't just do that. Thaw. I just ruminate. And I have now a sort of more articulated sense of the of the poems I would wish at some point to be able to write. The shapes are getting more clearer. I can't write those poems yet. But uh, I have to their properties are becoming clear. I have to ask you something I ask you very early on. What is a good day for a poet? Poet Louise Glick in particular. A good day? A good day is a day when I finish a poem that I think is really, really good. And um, Is there something that happens here and here when you when you Oh, there's, no, it, there's nothing like it. I mean, it's, it's the most marvelous sensation. Um, my husband has said of of that, that when I finish something that I'm pleased with and leave the study, I look like a nun who's just had an audience with a pope. Uh, I mean, it's it's like a divine visitation, and you you it, the feeling doesn't last long, and um, immediately you start to see the weaknesses, the limitations of the poem. I'm talking about though a stage after. Um, the ends of revision. I mean, so it's not that you go back and you see that whole sections are wrong. I mean, you've already been working on it a while, presumably. Um, at this point, I've got a pretty good nose for my own stuff. I mean, I, I know I know the poems that are the high watermarks. I know when I've done one like that, pretty much. Um, though, when your manner changes, you have a less um, evolved sense of the quality of the work because it's all so new. And, and uh, I rely, in any case, on the judgment of um, some poet friends. I show them why. <laughs> I, sh I show them my work.